Well, thank you very much, uh, Stuart. <coughs> it's always slightly unusual to hear one's own words being quoted back at you. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I come today uh, to bury the 2013 white paper, not to praise it. Um, released in May 2013, the Defence White Paper always seemed destined to have a short shelf life. At its release, we knew uh, the date set by Julia Gillard for an election, uh, 14th of September as it then was, and opinion polls suggested that a Labor defeat was highly likely, which meant to say that this white paper appeared more as a legacy statement of a previous government. As it happened, the document had an even shorter shelf life than was anticipated in May, uh, because Kevin Rudd returned to the leadership and he really had three key impacts on defence policy at his return. Uh, first, uh, Defence Minister and sponsor of the 2013 White Paper, Stephen Smith, announced his plan to retire from federal politics at the election and in effect stayed on as a caretaker Prime Minister uh, uh, for the rest of uh, the government's term. Uh, second, uh, Mr Rudd gave every indication that in fact he preferred his own white paper, uh, the 2009 document. And third, the election was uh, brought forward by a week to September 7. In effect, no Australian defence white paper has had as short a run as an expression of government policy as the 2013 version. Um, it may well become a collector's item, uh, but really only a model on how not to do policy. Um, now, the new coalition government has committed to produce another defence white paper within 18 months, so we can expect a policy release towards the middle of 2015. What is likely to survive from the 2013 policy into the 2015 version. Well, I would argue that there is unlikely to be too many changes in the early strategic overview and the international security policy chapters of the next white paper, uh, with one exception, and, and that exception is around the language used on China. Defence White Paper 13 articulated what we knew for some time uh, was an intent to pivot the ADF back to closer engagement in our region. The document made a very strong statement of intent to deepen our defence relations with Indonesia, uh, to reinvest in defence cooperation with Papua New Guinea, and it also pointed to a rapidly growing strategic relationship with Japan uh, and the potential for closer cooperation with Tokyo on industry matters. These things will certainly continue under a coalition government. It was welcome that the 2013 White Paper took a broad approach on thinking about Australia's strategic interests. I think the term Indo-Pacific strategic arc is likely to remain, um, not just because the foreign and defence ministers of the new governments come from Western Australia, but more importantly because it catches a clear and unique Australian strategic reality, uh, which is that the country faces both oceans, and our economy, our economic well-being, relies on the peaceful flow of commerce between these two oceans. Unlike the previous government's national security strategy, the White Paper in 2013 had a more hard-edged view of risks to regional security. I think it was very pleasing that the document tackled and then dismissed a rather tired shibboleth of Australia having to choose between China and the US the reality is neither of those countries wants us to choose and nor, it is, nor is it in our strategic interests to do so. The US alliance relationship also received a far more substantial consideration in the defence white paper than it did in the Asian century white paper and the right conclusion was reached that the alliance remains central to Australian interests. I personally think it was a pity that the white paper didn't take the opportunity to speed up cooperation with the US on Marine Corps and Air Force deployments, but that is something we should expect the new government to pursue. 
On force posture matters, the white paper reprised much of the ground covered in the force posture review study of 2012. And really, it was a major positive that no decisions were taken to permanently deploy ADF assets to the north and northwest, but decisions to undertake uh, facilities improvements on the Cocos Islands in Darwin and at RAF Base Tyndall were welcome. Now, uh, for those of you who watched the election campaign, I think it's fair to say that Navy might be said to have dodged a rather unexpected bullet during the election campaign when Prime Minister Rudd thought bubbled the idea of relocating Fleet Base East to Brisbane. Um, after the last few days, I'd suggest that's not a likely prospect anytime soon. All told, the strategic positioning of the ADF in the white paper represented a sensible approach. Much of this regional engagement activity is low cost but high value and represents the right focus for defence. My one major reservation about the international security aspects of the 2013 white paper was its treatment of China. Julia Gillard's 2013 white paper reversed course on much of the substance and some of the rhetoric of the 2009 white paper statement. The language on China was sensibly softened uh, because the aim of white papers shouldn't be to create enmity. But I think a new government will have to rethink the language it adopts on China. The 2013 white paper simply swung the pendulum too far back in the opposite direction. Uh, in response to the more hawkish 2009 white paper. The growth of Chinese military capabilities, coupled with a more assertive use of Chinese diplomacy in the North and South China Seas, worries many countries in the region. Uh, the next white paper needs to capture that sense of concern um, without exaggerating the risks to Australia um, and without exaggerating our capacity to shape regional security. Now, on defence spending, uh, and notwithstanding the small uh, injection of funding which accompanied the white paper for growler acquisition, um, this was a white paper fitted for but not with money. The new government will have to revisit that situation. What challenges will a new government face in developing its own defence white paper over the next 18 months? Well, Tony Abbott's announcement during the election campaign that, quote, within a decade, defence spending will be 2% of gross domestic product, end quote. That's very welcome, but it's going to be challenging to deliver. Um, uh, Mark Thompson, my colleague at ASPE, calculated that lifting defence spending from the present 1.67% of GDP to 2% means that in a decade the budget will be around 50 billion a year in 2022. Now, of course, the reality is that a 2% figure uh, is an arbitrary one. It has no real connection to an assessment of what Australia may or may not need to spend on defence. The only virtue of the 2% figure, as I see it, is that both major parties have started to use it as a target to grow the current budget. And if we assume a steady growth of spending up to 2% rather than just a one-off massive hike in spending at the end of the decade, Mr Abbott's commitment would cost an additional $35.5 billion over the next 10 years. Now, just as important as the context of policy, sorry, just as important as the content of policy is the means by which that policy is developed. And although discussing process can be eye-glazing to all but a few hardy souls in the policy business, the reality is that good processes make good policies. Um, I'd like, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, finish my comments by suggesting a number of steps that the government should take to improve the quality of defence policy-making processes for white papers. Governments, I think, should emphasise a strong commitment to what could be called the five C's, uh, base work on classified assessments, use cabinet as a direction setting forum, make choices, consult widely within official circles, and finally engage the broader community. 
Now, using classified assessments as the basis for decision making is a critical way to force government uh, to focus government on the difficult and hard-headed, hard-edged um, judgments about strategic developments. Equally, governments need to assess realistic assessments about the strengths and weaknesses of ADF capabilities. The unclassified white paper really explains policy to a wider audience, but it should be the very last thing that happens, the very last thing that is produced in a white paper process. Likewise, Cabinet's deep involvement is important to making sure that key ministers have the opportunity to talk issues through and decide on outcomes to which they will commit. In other words, they need to intellectualise the process of developing a white paper and own the product, own the results of it. Otherwise, as we saw with 2013, the document can very rapidly become an orphan. The third C was for choices. Now, the real policy purpose of white papers is to force choices on decision makers about defence priorities. And the 2013 white paper failed this test because it did not acknowledge the cumulative impact of spending cuts and deferrals. That situation is simply unlikely to be sustainable for the next white paper. Uh, so when it comes to defence, Cabinet should work on the basis that a choice delayed is a choice not made. The fourth C is for consultation. Uh, firstly, within a wider group of agencies and government departments, known as the national security community. One of the successes of the last decade has been to strengthen a whole of government approach to national security, for example, in enhancing counter-terrorism strategies. Now, consultation can slow policy making down, uh, but a new white paper, I think, would benefit from a stronger focus in this area. Uh, really, those comments, I think, um, mirror what um, uh, David Morrison said to us this morning. The final C in developing a good quality white paper process stands for community. Um, white papers can play an important role to educate community thinking on defence and to build support for policy by asking the community for their views. A discussion paper issued in advance of a white paper, as happened in 1999 and 2008, can help strengthen and define the right policy areas for community debate can shape international perceptions about the purpose of the work and can lay the ground for a favourable reception for a new white paper. Now, I should emphasise a key part of this consultation needs to be with the business community, uh, with defence industry, but broader than that, because I think um, uh, it's that group which is going to be critical, a critical part of delivering capability. Uh, I, I guess a message I have for the defence industry is it, it ought not to be shy in putting its views to government at this time about what it thinks needs to be done. And this needs to be a genuine discussion, not simply a one-way transmission from Canberra to the rest of the country. Uh, my second suggestion for the new government is that they should commission an independent review of Australia's defence capabilities in advance of releasing a new defence white paper. Now, it wouldn't be the first time that such a study has been undertaken. In 1985, the then Defence Minister, Kim Beasley, commissioned Paul Dibb to undertake a defence capability review. Uh, Paul's here in the front row of the audience. I'm, I'm not just saying this, Paul, because you're there. It was part of my speech beforehand. But the value of uh, Paul's review was that it was independent and it made it possible to cut through long-standing rivalries between the military and the civilian parts of the service. Uh, civilian parts of defence and between the three services. Now, in 2013, defence is genuinely a much more joint and collaborative organisation than in 1986, but I don't think any of us can be naive about the fact that a study which forces difficult choices between military capabilities is almost impossible to be generated inside the very agencies that have to take those cuts. The DIP review also set out a solid basis for making disciplined judgments about equipment acquisitions. Now, at the time, there was a rather narrowly cast Defence of Australia policy, which I think would need to be altered to suit the strategic circumstances of 2013-14. It will need to have a stronger regional focus, and it needs to take account of an even deeper alliance relationship with the US. 
The final virtue of the DIB review was that it gave the government of the day an arm's length assessment of what it needed to do in defence. It helped shape a public debate and build a consensus around the outcomes adopted in the White Paper of 1987. On defence budgeting, a future government should commit itself early and publicly to lifting the standard of commentary in the next white paper on long-term budget issues. It's difficult to escape the charge that the budget chapters in both the 2009 and 2013 white papers set out to conceal more than they revealed about future budget intentions. Now, the aim should be to return to a long-term budget projection for defence that looks ahead 20 years to cover the life of major capital equipment projects. The candour of the budget chapter in the next Defence White Paper will be a critical benchmark of how seriously the document should be taken. A final suggestion for the next White Paper is for the government to commit to launching the document by means of a statement to Parliament. Now, such an approach was once the norm for governments making major new policy announcements. Regrettably, the last two white papers have been launched at highly orchestrated media events, effectively precluding the opportunity for a parliamentary debate. One rough rule of thumb is that the bigger the launch, the less there is to the statement. So, the 2013 Defence White Paper demonstrated some old verities of policy making. First, policies are unlikely to last very long if they lose their key sponsors. Second, the policy outcomes are only as good as the processes which produced them. Third, policy without money is a weak and imperfect product. That said, the document made a contribution which will last in its use of the term Indo-Pacific strategic arc and its strategic policy settings I think are likely to be echoed in the 2015 White Paper. The Coalition Government therefore has an opportunity to build on the statement. It can keep the language and the policy initiatives it values, it can add its own perspectives on defence policy settings. The best approach would be for the Government to be more disciplined in its policy development work over the next 18 months or so, and also to find a realistic way to balance available funding with its strategic aspirations. Thanks very much.